Yo. Happy Retribution Day. This one goes out to my main man, Rogers. I'm sorry that you had that weak bitch of a father. Too much intelligence to turn into a Chad. I'm sorry for all the sex and love you never had. Rogers, born and raised within a twisted world. 22 years dealing with rejection hurled. I'm sorry. They didn't see the perfect gentleman Made to suffer by every stuck up feminine But Elliot, my man enacted retribution Started our cause like a one man revolution I feel you, I know that feel brah I know it's real brah Women can't see our appeal brah Why should they get happiness while we are all alone? I swear to fuck I'll follow you and make everyone atone the robots are here to carry on your message loud and clear Every single normie will know us and us they will fear We are the betas, tired of the women who hate us We are the virgins, not ready for a fucking other year of this Most of us sitting here have never even be kissed This is the uprising and you will not be missed Cause if we can have her, then we'll make them cadavers I'm sick of being a virgin when I'm the best version that a man could ever be And it's all on you I swear to fuck I'm a supreme gentleman too It didn't have to be this way You did how you had to pay My right to love was real You didn't let me out of feel <laughs> You women <laughs> Are you proud Elliot? Your followers are here Are you smiling Elliot? All right, hey babe, it's podcast number seven, lucky number seven. You haven't lost track by now? Um, no, no, not by now. So today, <clears throat> I wanted to touch up on the Elliot Rogers story, and I, don't know, I guess wrap it up. I wanted to get a, more, a bit more deeper into it. Mm-hmm. I uh, found some selected quotes uh, I pulled from the article and from an uh, or from the from an article on Fusion, and then also from selections I made myself from the manifesto that he sent, and a little bit from Wikipedia. Just so we're clear about what happened, you know, this this is an educational podcast, I like to think. It's pretty educational. You talk about a wide variety of subjects, mm-hmm. I'd say. Yeah, maybe we can educate Jeff on some taste in video games one day. Oh, God. Don't yeah. get me started. Yeah, we'll have to do that. Jeff likes getting talked about on the podcast. <laughs> Makes him feel popular. <laughs> He's our own little Elliot Roger. <laughs> Love me. Love me. I'm the supreme gentleman. Why don't you love me? <laughs> so, let's uh, begin. I have some notes over here on my computer. So, you know, before I begin... Okay, we're back. So, I brought up the Wikipedia page for the 2014 Isla Vista killings. Isla Vista. So, what is that like? Good View Island? Vista's view... Um... Isla is probably island. Yeah, remember American Dad, Isla Island? That was the joke. Oh, yeah, huh. Mm-hmm. See, you do learn from TV. Mm-hmm. So on May 23rd, 2014, in Isla Vista, California, 22-year-old Elliot Roger killed six people and injured 14 others near the campus of University of California, Santa Barbara, before taking his own life. The attack began when Elliot stabbed three men to death in his apartment afterwards he drove to a sorority house and shot three female students outside killing two he drove to a nearby deli and shot to death a male student who was inside he began to speed through isla vista shooting and wounding several pedestrians and striking several others with his car roger exchanged gunfire with police twice during the attack receiving a non-fatal gunshot wound to the hip the rampage ended when his car crashed into a parked vehicle and came to a stop. 
Police found him dead inside the car with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Before driving to the sorority house, Roger uploaded to YouTube a video entitled Elliot Rogers Retribution, which I used the full length of that at the end of uh, the last podcast. That's where I got most of my uh, voice samples from. In which he outlined details of his upcoming attack and his motives. He explained that he wanted to punish women for rejecting him and punish sexually active men for living more enjoyable life than his. Hmm. Which will bring up the quotes about that. After uploading the video, Roger emailed a lengthy autobiographical manuscript to approximately a dozen acquaintances and family members. The document, which he entitled My Twisted World was made available on the internet and became widely known as his manifesto. (laughs) In it, he described his childhood, family conflicts, frustration over not being able to find a girlfriend, his hatred of women, his contempt for racial minorities and interracial couples, and his plans for what he described as retribution. So, yeah, he, uh... Went to a gun range when he was waiting to buy a new laptop that he'd spilled coffee on because he was mad because he saw some girl. Oh my gosh. That didn't, or a girl walked by him and didn't instantly want to be with him. Ugh. So he got la- he got his laptop wet and, and he begged his mom to buy him a brand new one. Which of course she probably did. Yeah, but he had to go all the way to Oxnard because the Best Buy near him didn't have the particular computer he wanted. <sighs> So he goes to a gun range and he shoots a gun, I think for the first time, and then he starts, you know. Getting ideas. Basically. Well, he'd had the ideas, but now, like, he, uh. Now he had a way to follow through. Yeah, he had, like, a little emotional moment. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> he was like, oh, I can't believe I'm actually here. I'm doing this, getting ready for the day of retribution. So, you know, the best part about him is sharing him with women about Elliot. <laughs> you get to see all the creeped out looks on everyone's faces. Yeah, we need to have the visual element uh, pretty soon. Uh, so, this is from like the like the beginning of his thing, and I just thought it was interesting to start with this because it'll it'll go in. There'll be like a thing later when he meets this person again. Mm. So, my first real friend I made in the United States was a girl named Maddie Humphreys. Isn't that ironic? The first friend I made in the United States was a girl. She was the first female friend I've ever had, and she would be the last. Maddie and I started playing together at farm school, and eventually my parents became very good friends with her parents. Maddie's father is the famous British musician Paul Humphreys, and her mother is named Maureen, though we would call her Mo. They had a nice little house in Hidden Hills. Our families got together often to have barbecues and dinner. I was a five-year-old boy playing with a girl my own age like any normal boy would do. I was enjoying life in a world that I loved. I was happy and completely oblivious to the fact that my future on this world would only turn to darkness and misery because of girls. This girl, who was my friend, Maddie Humphreys, would eventually come to represent everything I hate and despise. Everything that is against me. And I ever- roll. <laughs> and everything that I'm against. I'm playing innocently with this girl in a manner that all children play. We even took baths together. It was the only time in my life that I would see a girl my my own age naked. When I think about this experience I had during my friendship with her, it makes me think ominously, omni, uh, ominously. ominously of the fact that all children, boys and girls, start out the same. We all start out innocent, and we all start out together. Only through the experiences and circumstances of growing up do we drift apart, form allegiances, and face each other as enemies. Ugh. I know. Ugh. That that is when wars happen, and that is when the true nature of humanity rises to the surface. At this stage of my life, of course, my war hadn't started yet. And it wouldn't start for a long time. I was enjoying my life without a care in the world, not knowing that all my joy was destined to turn to dust. So what do you think about that? What a fucking crybaby. What a He grew fucking... up rich with somewhat, like, his parents were famous? Uh, not Kinda, famous. Um, his mom went with fam- went around with famous guys, and his dad worked in Hollywood. They they were in that he, kind of 
yeah he has group of people he has they had connections yeah so he starts off with this well-to-do life he's got all this money and he has all these awesome experiences and he knows all of these cool people and he gets everything he wants and yet nothing is good enough Mm -hmm. just because he doesn't have a girlfriend oh yeah he acts like a big child and he has like this childish boys versus girls yeah like view Mm -hmm. the world like that never got fixed Mm -hmm. you know there comes a point when when children realize so when he was about 18 this happened during the remaining days of 2010 i joined my mother and sister at mom's boyfriend's or mom's boyfriend jack's beach house in malibu to spend a few nights they arrived there a few hours before me and by the time i reached the house they had already invited a few guests for an afternoon get together to my outrage i saw that mother had invited family friend maddie humphreys and her boyfriend i was looking forward to having another respite at the beautiful malibu mansion where i could indulge myself in opulence and forget about my depressing loneliness having a young couple lurking around only reminded me of my insignificance i was extremely upset uh, with my mother for inviting them she should have been more considerate Mm. yeah all about him oh big time big time big time there's uh there was something else with this maddie girl he kind of goes on about it and then so soon after you know he sees that girl he uh maddie again he he like he it upsets him so bad he ends up crying goes on a long walk by himself and he ends up crying that night of course that happens a lot uh he gets overwhelmed very easily he cries a lot too yes Uh, Towards the end of the manifesto, after he'd been pushed off that balcony for starting that fight, Mm. uh, he was hobbling around in his little crutches, and he sees this girl Maddie and her mom again. Towards the end of the month, my mother invited Maddie and Mo Humphreys over for dinner. Mother had recently been reconnecting with her old friend Mo. Maddie had just graduated from UCS, or uh, USC, rather, a university renowned for its abundance of spoiled bratty students who partied all the time very similar to uh ucsb i often call ucs i did it again (laughs) usc (laughs) the university of spoiled cunts just like i call ucsb the university of california spoiled brats which you know ironic i know right see brilliant fitting nicknames before maddie came i stalked her facebook a bit and I saw that she was the exact image of everything I hated in women. She was popular, spoiled USC girl who partied with her hot, beautiful, blonde-haired clique of friends. All of them looked like absolute cunts. And, I, and my hatred for them grew from each picture I saw from her profile. Profile. They were the kind of beautiful, popular people who lived pleasurable lives and would look down on me as inferior scum, never accepting me as the as one of them. They were my enemies. They represented everything that was wrong with this world. Maddie was my first friend in America. As a child, I played with her as an equal. Now she was my enemy. I would take great delight in torturing and flaying her and every single one of her spoiled, obnoxious, evil friends. And when her and her mother came to eat dinner with us, I had to keep calm as I hobbled out of my room on my crutches to greet them. The crutches that he put himself in, essentially. Yeah, so that's towards the end. Gosh. So, a little bit old, like later on, he sees a family friend kiss a girl. In spring, something horrible happened that will haunt me forever. We met up with the Bubenheims in Sagebrush Cantina in Calabasas, and a friend of Paulina's was there with them, named Nicole, a girl around my age. She sat next to Leo the whole time, and by the end of the dinner, the two of them were making out. 12-year-old Leo was making out with a girl who was almost my age. Not only does Leo have a better social life, now he was making out with girls at age 12. Well, maybe he wasn't a huge douchebag. Mm. They made out for a long time, and I could see them tongue kiss. I knew They knew I was watching with envy, and they still did it. I bet that lucky bastard took great satisfaction from my envy. And there I was, watching a boy four years younger than me experience everything I've longed for to kiss a girl. 
to be worthy of a girl's attraction. So by age 17, he'd already decided that he needed to get revenge on people who had sex. Quote, One day I found some posts on the internet about teenagers having sex, and I was once again reminded of the life I, was, I had been denied. I felt that no girl would ever want to have sex with me, and I developed extreme feelings of envy and hatred and anger towards anyone who had a sex life. I saw them as the enemy. I felt condemned to live a life of lonely celibacy. Cel why can I say this? Celibacy, right? Celibacy, yes. Celibacy, God. While other boys were allowed to experience the pleasures of sex, all because girls didn't want me, I felt inferior and undesirable. This time, however, I couldn't just stand by and accept such injustice anymore. I refused to continue hiding away from the world and forgetting about all the insults it dealt to me. I began to have fantasies of becoming very powerful and stopping everyone from having sex. I wanted to take their sex away uh. from them, just like they took it away from me. Ugh. I saw sex as an evil and barbaric act, Ugh. all because I was unable to have it. This was the major turning point. My anger made me stronger inside. This was this was when I formed my ideas that sex should be outlawed. Ugh. It was the only way to make the world fair and just. If I can't have it, I will destroy it. That's the conclusion I came to right then and there. And that's like his little motto. If I can't have it, I will destroy it. Oh, oh my God. Let's see. Uh, and he keeps this going all the way, you know, until he's 18, obviously. I delved more into learning as much as I could from books at Barnes & Noble. I expanded on the political and philosophical ideas I concocted when I was 17, and I soon became even more radical about them than I ever was before. It was all fueled by my wish to punish everyone who is sexually active, because I concluded that it wasn't fair that other people were able to experience sex while I had been denied it all my life. I started to have the desire to create a world where no one's allowed to have sex or relationships. I again saw that as the perfect fair world. Reproduction can be accomplished without sex through artificial insemination. Sex is evil as it gives too much pleasure to those who don't deserve it. This and, is like some cult bullshit right there. That's what that sounds like. Yeah, and <laughs> speaking of things people don't deserve, uh, so... I refused all the jobs that my life coach, Tony, suggested to me. The problem was that most of the jobs that were available to me at the time were jobs I considered beneath me. My mother wanted me to get a simple retail job, and, thought, and the thought of myself doing that was mortifying. It would kill him. That's what that means. It would be completely against my character. I am an, indo an intellectual who is destined for greatness. I would never perform a low-class service job. When I found out about this, I started to harbor the hope that my mother would get married to this man, and I will be part of that rich family. He's talking about this uh, guy at the Malibu house. That I will definitely be a way. That there will definitely be a way out of my miserable and insignificant life. Uh, money would solve everything. Money would solve everything. He literally said that. Yeah. Money would solve everything. I started to frequently ask my mother to seek marriage with this man, or any wealthy man for that matter. She was adamant. She ad She always adamantly refused, and she demanded that I stop talking about it. She told me that she never wanted to get married again after uh, her experience with my father. I told her that she should sacrifice her well-being for the sake of my happiness. Just straight up told his mom that. Yeah, and this also, when she was trying to reconnect with her friend Mo, he was just like, ah, oh, he shouldn't have ever invited her daughter over here and her friend. How, you know, she should have been more considerate. Yeah. Oh, God. Selfish asshole. So, uh, I think between those two times, he got this book from his father. He got The Secret. <laughs> My father gave me a book called The Secret after I had dinner at his house in February. He said that it'll help me develop, develop a positive attitude. Uh, I know. The book explained the fundamentals of the concept known as the law of attraction. 
I had never heard or read anything quite like this before, and I was intrigued. The theory stated that one's thoughts were connected to the universal to a universal force that can shape the future of reality. Being one who always loved fantasy and magic, and who has always wished, uh, and who always wished to such things were real, and he wrote that. I was swept up in a temporary wave of enthusiasm over this, over this book, the prospect that I could change my future just by visualizing it in my mind. Visualizing in my mind the life I wanted filled me with a surge of hope that my life could turn out happy. The idea was ridiculous, of course, but the world is, world is such a ridiculous place that already I figured I might as well try to give it. Ah, oh, man, I'm getting, like, fucking dyslexia. Do you want me to read some? Uh, after this. I need to get better at it. But the world is such a ridiculous place already that I figured I might as well try. In addition, I was so desperate to have something to live for that I wanted to believe in the law of attraction, even if it was proven to me it wasn't real. Once I finished reading it, I drove all the way to Point Dume in Malibu and climbed out to the cliffs at the very edge. It was a windy day and I could see the ocean rolling below me. As night fell, I looked out into the stars and proclaimed to the universe everything I wanted in life. I proclaimed how I wanted to be a millionaire so I could live a luxurious life and finally be able to attract beautiful girls I covet so much. <sighs> like your neighbor's cow. <laughs> I wished to make up for the years of youth that I wasted in bleak loneliness. And by doing so, I would get revenge on everyone who thought they were better than me just by becoming better than them through the accumulation of wealth. I believe that the only way for me to attain this wealth at that time was to win the lottery. <laughs> and I and that is what I visualized doing. I then descended the cliff top on Point Dume and I walked along the Malibu Ocean just like I did a couple months previously at the beach house. I saw a couple walking along the shore ahead of me. The man looked to be in his late 20s, early 30s, and the girl he was walking with looked like a supermodel. I assumed he was very rich and owned a nice house in Malibu. The two of them were walking hand in hand, and I saw him subtly place his hand on her ass every now and then. He was living the life. He was in heaven. I was envious. But since the man was older than me, it also gave me a twinge of hope, especially after my... Uh, after my proclamation to the universe at the clifftop, if I became a multimillionaire, I would be able to walk on the beach with a beautiful girlfriend too, and my life would be complete. That was what I wanted. That was what I wished for in my future. As I've always believed, I am destined for great things. Becoming a multimillionaire at a young age is what I'm meant for. My faith was soon broken. As I bought a few Mega Million lottery tickets and I visualized myself being the winner, I usually visualized it by meditating on the rooftop of my mother's apartment right at the time of the, of the drawing. A part of me knew it was impossible to will the universe to make me the winner just by wishing for it on a rooftop, but I was so desperate that I wanted to believe I could. I wanted to believe I had the power to do it. And after failing to win, when the jackpot reset because someone else won, I lost all faith in that book. I almost ripped it apart in frustration. I desperately pondered if there was some other way I could make, a, make millions of dollars at my age, but I came up with nothing. I realized that my miserable, lonely, virgin life was going to continue, and my only hope was to give Santa Barbara a try. His parents were sending him off to college because he wouldn't get a job. Yeah. And then he'd go to college... But he'd only take, like, two or three classes. And then he wouldn't attend most of the time. Yeah, because a girl would be there, and she wouldn't smile at him. Yeah, and he just couldn't focus on anything other than that, everywhere he went. It was an obsession. An obsession. So he had two housemates <clears throat> in Santa Barbara. And there weren't were, three? Uh, that was later on. Oh, oh yeah. that's right, okay. And actually, he only had two housemates then. Uh, one of the people he murdered was a friend. Oh, that's that's unfortunate. I know. Wrong place, wrong time. I know. So his first week in Santa Barbara went like this. I f my two housemates were nice, but they kept inviting over this friend of theirs named Chance. He was a black boy who came over all the time, and I hated his cocksure attitude. 
Inevitably, a vile incident occurred between me and him. I was eating a meal in the kitchen when he came over and started bragging to my housemates about his success with girls. I couldn't stand it, so I proceeded to ask them all if they were virgins. They all looked at me weirdly and said they had lost their virginity long ago. Long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I felt so inferior as it reminded me of how much I missed out in life. And then this black boy named Chance said that he lost his virginity when he was only 13. In addition, he said that the girl he lost his virginity to was a blonde white girl. I was so enraged that I almost splashed him with my orange juice. I indignantly told him that I did not believe him. And then I went into my room to cry. And I cried and I cried and I cried. And then I called my mother and I cried to her on the phone. (laughs) You would think this is a parody. You would think. The way he writes it, you would honestly think this is a parody. I know. How could an inferior, ugly black boy be able to get a white girl and not me? I am a beautiful, I am beautiful and I am half white myself. I am descended from British (laughs) aristocracy and I am descended, he is descended from slaves. I deserve it more. (laughs) I tried not to believe his foul words, but they were already said, and it was hard to erase from my mind. Yeah, his foul words. If this is actually true, if this ugly black filth was able to have sex with a blonde girl at the age of 13, while I've had to suffer virginity all my life, then this just proves how ridiculous the female gender is. If they would give themselves... To this filthy scum but they reject me the injustice exclamation point so yeah he needs some new <laughs> some new uh people a year later you know because they shuffle him around from place to place because he's always crying their names were ryan and angel and to my dismay they were uh they were of hispanic race in addition The two of them were already friends with each other, which meant they could possibly gang up on me if any conflicts were to arise. Oh boy. They also seemed like rowdy, low-class types. My first impression of them soured me, but I tried to have a tried to be pleasant and not show it. Oh really? No, oh, I know. I oh cry. really? You tried? I I know. You poor thing. Could you imagine how it was in that house? It's a good thing he just spent all his time in his room. Ugh. The two of them acted cordial to me on the first day, but after observing them for a bit, I had a bad feeling that they would be trouble to live with. <laughs> and they were my housemates for a whole year. A whole year. When I was alone in my room, I panicked to myself at how dire a situation this was. This was extremely disappointing. I was hoping to get a decent, mature, clean cut, clean cut, <laughs> clean cut housemates. Instead, I got low class scum. So on the second day, this happened. They started inviting their equally rowdy friends into my apartment, and we exchanged more small talk. To my indignant surprise, they asked me the question I always dreaded answering. Are you a virgin? I wonder why they asked that. Oh, I know. I, I admitted that I was a virgin. I always admitted the truth about this. It was my life struggle, and I couldn't lie about such a thing. Then they had the audacity to tell me that they lost their virginity long ago, bragging about all the girls they had slept with. I particularly hated Angel because of his ugly pig face. How could such an ugly animal have had sexual experiences with girls, and yet I haven't? What was wrong with this world? I got so angry that I went to my room and I punched the wall. They heard me and started laughing. (laughs) They probably heard him cry. Oh, my hand. (laughs) Boo-hoo-hoo. Me, me, me. They heard me and started laughing, and it was almost a repeat of what I experienced with that black boy named Chance in the old apartment, except this time it was worse because these were my housemates for the year. After that day, I almost got into a physical fight with Angel. The ugly pig kept acting as if girls thought he was more attractive than me. Ha. Huh. I am a beautiful, magnificent gentleman, and he is a low-class, pig-faced 
thug. I had enough of his cocksure attitude, and I started to call him exactly what he was. I tried to insult him as much as I could, telling him how superior I am to him, and saying that he was low class. Oh my god, it would have been so funny if like Elliot was just like was poor. <laughs> Let's see, he tried to attack me, but Ryan, being the more mellow of the two, held him back. A pity. I was wishing for a chance to hurt that obnoxious little animal. As if he could. He's kind of a pipsqueak. I know. He would have gotten his face beaten in. Hell yeah. Although I suppose it was for the best. My life was too important to risk doing anything rash. And that was before he got pushed off the balcony. In a panic, I immediately called my ma- my mother. And he cries to her and he tells her he has to get a new place to live. And then she, his mom ends up having to pay an extra $100 a month to put him in a different room. Jesus Lord. Yeah, I know. So here he is talking about women. Females truly have something mentally wrong with them. Their minds are flawed. And at this point in my life, I was beginning to see it. The more I explored my college town of Isla Vista, the more ridiculousness I, w- I witnessed. All of the hot, beautiful girls walked around with obnoxious, tough, jock-type men who partied all the time and acted crazy. They should be going for intelligent gentlemen such as myself. Women are sexually attracted to the wrong type of man. Mm. This is a major flaw in the very foundation of humanity. It is completely and utterly wrong in every sense of the word. Yeah, that women don't like little annoying people who make no effort to talk to you who do nothing but complain and cry on the phone to mommy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, i'm getting lunch with his dad in santa barbara when we sat down at our table i saw a young couple sitting a few tables down the row the sight of them enraged me to no end especially because it was a dark-skinned mexican guy dating a hot blonde white girl <laughs> and i regarded it as a great insult to my dignity how could an inferior mexican guy be able to date a white blonde girl while i was still suffering as a lonely virgin i was ashamed to be in a in such an inferior position in front of my father and when he saw the two of them kissing when i saw the two of them kissing i could barely contain my rage i stood up in anger and i was about to walk up to them and pour my glass of soda all over their heads i probably would have if father wasn't there i was seeing i was seething with envious rage and my father was there to watch it all it was so humiliating i wasn't the son i wanted to present to my father i should be the one with the hot blonde girl making my father proud instead my father had to watch me suffer in a pathetic position Life is so cruel to me. So, this is when he realizes, you know, this is uh, how he starts putting together the whole revenge thing. I ordered my coffee and I sat down on one of the chairs to relax. And this was probably a few months later. Uh, A few moments later, when I looked up from my drink, I saw a young couple standing in line. The two of them were kissing passionately. The boy looked like an obnoxious punk. He was tall and wore baggy pants. The girl was a pretty blonde. They looked like they were in the throes of a passionate passionate sexual attraction to each other, rubbing their bodies together and tongue kissing in front of everyone. I was absolutely livid with envious hatred. When they left the store, I followed them to their car and splashed my coffee all over them. The boy yelled at me, and I quickly ran away in Which, fear. Which, isn't that assault? Throwing yeah, that's hot assault. coffee on someone? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. And he knows it, too. I was panicking as I got into my car and drove off. Shaking with rage field excitement, I drove all the way to Vaughn's at the Fairview Plaza, and I spent three hours in my car trying to contain my uh, tumultuous... Oh, God. Tumultuous? Tumultuous emotions. I had, <laughs> I had never struck back at my enemies before, and I had felt a small sense of spiteful gratification for doing so. I hated them so much. Even though I splashed them with my coffee, he was still the winner. He was going home to have passionate, heavenly sex with his beautiful girlfriend. And I was going home to my lonely room to sleep alone in my lonely bed. I had never felt so miserable and mistreated in my life. I cursed the world for condemning me to, to such suffering. 
<laughs> I wanted to do horrible things to that couple. I wanted to inflict pain on all young couples. It was around this point in my life that I realized I was capable of doing such things. I would happily do such things. I was capable of killing them, and I wanted to. I wanted to kill them slowly to strip the skin off their flesh. They deserve it. The males deserve it for taking the females away from me. And the females deserve it for choosing those males instead of me. Every time I looked out my window to the courtyard, I saw young people socializing. Obnoxious, drunk boys were chatting up pretty girls. And I wondered with great panic if they would be having sex together that night. I often fantasized about barging into their rooms while they had sex and slashing them to death with my knife. He thinks like like some really jealous women do. Yeah. Yeah, they're jealous of something, and so they focus that uh, that feeling of inferiority on everyone else, and they make it so that <clears throat> in their heads, everyone else is in the wrong, not them. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. <sighs> it's so that you don't have to feel bad about yourself, or that you don't have to think that you're doing anything wrong. Yeah. Definitely, or just uh, to make yourself feel better. Yeah, it's their it's their problem, not mine. It's their fault. Yeah, he's definitely can't. I mean, men behave that way too, obviously. But like a lot of really jealous, inferior, uh, not inferior, insecure women will feel like that. They kind of have the same mentality. Yeah, he definitely has intense insecurity. And it's really surprising to me. Uh, like he feels so superior to the rest of the world that. Like, I'm surprised that in his sheer hatred for women, he didn't just decide that he didn't need one and go down some other crazy path. That probably would have been a great thing that happened to him. Like, as the reality is, he didn't. No, he didn't. No. You know, he might have been, like, you know, there might have been something for him, but he didn't mm-hmm. want to work hard towards anything. And I feel like even if in this state he had gotten a girlfriend, he wouldn't have appreciated her and all he would have done was found flaw in her. She wouldn't have been enough. Oh, because, yeah. She would have insulted yeah, him. Yeah, he's the supreme gentleman. He deserves the best. He, you would, know? he probably would be horrifically jealous. Yeah. And, if, and imagine trying to end a relationship with this guy. You couldn't. He'd kill you. He'd kill you. I know. Look what he did. Mm-hmm. My teenage years were completely denied to me by the cruelness of women. The only way I could make up for it was if I could have an extraordinary sex life in my 20s. I would have to have... A, a profoundly amazing decade in my 20s to compensate for all the misery I experienced in my teens. If I fail to do that, then I have nothing to live for. Sadly, I will only experience the opposite in my early 20s, and it will destroy me. He also seems to think <coughs> that youth is the time to find love, mm-hmm. when really most people... They don't end up finding their true partners until 30s, you know, sometimes 40s in some cases. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're you're really lucky if you find a significant partner in your early 20s. Yeah, I mean, we were very lucky. You and I were extremely lucky. We found each other when we were teenagers. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a good thing I wasn't obsessed with just having, uh, being with blondes. No. You know, super rail-thin blondes. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Where was I if this fucking... So... This is from the final days. Uh, shortly after this, he, uh, you know, he get, he starts acting more and more aggressive. He gets real drunk and he attacks this Asian guy who was talking to a white girl at a party and started like trying to bully him. And then he gets pushed out of that party and he goes outside and he's just kind of sitting out there drunk. And uh, some other people show up and then he starts acting like cocky towards them and like insulting them and they insult him back and he gets mad you know (laughs) it's like what were you expecting kid and he he takes his anger out on the women because he tries to push the girls off the ledge it was like a 10 foot thing again assault they could break their necks falling 10 feet yeah so the he got pushed off by the men and uh he ended up breaking his leg but he was so drunk he didn't realize and he you know he goes back to get his sunglasses and then he gets you know He's like Gucci Mane sunglasses. We had mentioned on the other one. His $300 sunglasses that he mm-hmm. loves so much. Yeah, he left those at a party, but he went to the wrong house. 
and he started like demanding. It was the neighbor's house, and he was like screaming on the Mm -hmm, lawn. mm -hmm. So they kick his ass, and they stole his gold chain that is uh, is an antique his grandmother gave him. What a waste, by the way. It was probably a beautiful necklace. Yeah, he cried about it to his mom. She bought him another one (sighs) to make him feel better. God. Yeah, you, you could see him wearing it in his last days in those uh, retribution videos. Wonder where that necklace ended up. That's I wonder where it is right now. Some cops kids probably wearing it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I needed, I needed two working handguns at the same time, as that was how I planned to commit suicide with two simultaneous, <laughs> tenuous, uh shots to the head coupled with my hate field eagerness to carry out my act of revenge there was also an extreme sense of fear inside me part of me still didn't want to do it it will mean my death and i have always been afraid of death apparently not because he seems determined to give himself reasons to off himself yeah yeah, the, the world isn't listening to his baby cries like his mom does. How dare those girls give their love and sex to those other men and not me? How dare those girls give their love and sex to those other men and not me? I constantly think when I see young couples, there is nowhere in the world I can go anymore. There is no more life to live. The day of retribution is all I have. It is the final solution to all of the injustices of this twisted world. Ha, he said it. By doing this, I will set right all of the wrongs I had to face and my sorry excuse of a life. I am not part of the human race. Humanity has rejected me. The female of the human species has never wanted to mate with me. Oh, God. (laughs) So... So how could I possibly consider myself part of humanity? Humanity has never accepted me among them, and I know why. I am more than human. I am superior to them all. I am Elliot Roger. Magnificent. Glorious. Supreme. Intimate. Divine. I am the closest thing there is to a living God. Humanity is a disgusting, depraved, and evil species. And it is my purpose to punish them all. I will purify the world of everything that is wrong with it. And on the day of retribution, I will truly be a powerful god, punishing everyone I deem impure and depraved. Again, how far did he think he was going to get? Well, I mean, he, he had six magazines and he had like over 400 bullets. But he's talking about, like, revenge on the world. How yeah. far did he honestly think he was going to get? Well, um, this is a narcissistic thing. And yeah. it's a grandiose, um, like, the brain. I, could, I listened to this three-hour podcast by a, a, a psychiatrist right after this whole thing went down. And he, he was breaking it all down. And he had said, uh, I think his name was Dr. Kim Honda or something like that, or Chris Honda. Uh uh, I'll I'll link it in the description. I probably got the name wrong. I remember his name was Dr. Honda, though. And he said that, like, it's a defense. Like, his anxiety attacks him. So his brain makes up this huge, grandiose fantasy to, like, inflate him. Right. And he has, that like, justifies these, him. Mm-hmm. And it, he seems to have, like, on narcissistic highs. And, and he's, he's delusional, too. And he contradicts himself, too. Mm-hmm. He's worthless, and he's in an inferior position, and he, now he's a supreme gentleman. He's also extremely hypocritical. Extremely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He has, like, he must have read over this, like, 50 times going through each thing. So I'm wondering why, I mean, did he, like, he just was not, he was so, un, like, not self-aware at all. No. You know, like like reading this, like a normal human being reads this and they laugh and they're like, really? Yeah, it, it, it really feels like a, a parody. Yeah. And it's like, how could anyone write this in all seriousness? Yeah, you definitely feel more sorry for him if you read the, uh, the beginning of it. Because he did have a lonely childhood and there mm-hmm. were a lot of things out of his control. Mm-hmm. He wasn't always so psychopathic. But at a certain point, he just, like, as a teenager, he just chose to sink into World of Warcraft. And he resented his stepmom because she'd actually put limits on his World of Warcraft. And his mom, his real mom, would basically just let him do whatever he wanted, Mm -hmm. you know. He was very spoiled, so he never had a chance to get real with himself and become a normal person. 
Yeah, yeah. And on top of the fact, like, this is a kid that had issues. Mm -hmm. So when a kid has issues, I can definitely see why, like, you just have this um, instinct just to to spoil. Mm -hmm. To spoil. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because, like, well, I can't help him, so I'll just give him whatever toy he wants. Yeah. Yeah, a very similar thing happened with Chris Chan. Obviously, like, his parents couldn't help him, and they literally just... You know, they just drowned toys. him in video games and comics and toys. Mm-hmm. And crayons. Yeah. Yeah, and he's still living a very uh, childish existence. And Elliot Roger would just be a loser. You know, he, he'd be living off his mom still. He'd still be complaining mm-hmm. the same way. Yeah, he should I mean, like, he couldn't... I'd say, like, he could have been, like, some, like, internet shit lord. But, like, he, he didn't have any dedication to anything. No. 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 No, he's very, Uh, very flimsy in his pursuits. Like, because this suicide was an easy way out. Yeah, exactly. He, like, when it... That's him being too lazy to live a real life. Yeah, so he's just... He he can't be uh, famous for doing anything good. He can't make millions before he's 30. Yeah, he can't make a a legitimate name for himself. He didn't find the love of his life before 20, you know? Yeah, you know, because everything's supposed to be like a fucking teen sitcom. Like a goddamn Disney movie. Yeah, like fucking 901 2.0 or whatever the fuck it's called. Mm -hmm. I butchered that. Like fucking Saved by the Bell or something or Dawson's Creek. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the epilogue and this is going to go on. You want to read this, babe? You should... You know, I think you might enjoy this. Can you see this good? Yeah, I can. All right, so start an epilogue. And that is how my tragic life ends. Who would have thought my life would turn out this way? I didn't. There was a time when I thought this world was a good and happy place. As a child, my whole world was innocent. It wasn't until I went through puberty and started desiring girls that my whole life turned into a living hell. I desired girls, but girls never desired me back. There is something very wrong with that. (laughs) It is an injustice that cannot go unpunished. There is no way I could live a happy life with such a scenario. Not only did I have to waste my entire youth suffering and loneliness and unfulfilled desire, but I had to live with the knowledge that other boys my age were able to have all of the experiences I craved for. It is absolutely unfair and unjust. In addition, I had to suffer the shame of other boys respecting me less because I didn't get any girls. Everyone knew I was a virgin. Everyone knew how undesirable I was to girls, and I hated everyone just for knowing it. I want people to think that girls adore me. I want to feel worthy. There's no pride in living as a lonely, unwanted outcast. I wouldn't even call it living. (laughs) Well, it's not. I am not meant to live such a pathetic, miserable life. This is not my place in this world. I will not bow down and accept such a horrific fate. If humanity will not give me a worthy place among them, then I will destroy them all. I am better than all of them. I am a god. Exacting my retribution is my way of proving my true worth to the world. In the midst of my suffering, I have been able to see the world much clearer than others. I have vision that other people lack. Through my suffering, I have been able to see just how twisted and wrong this world really is. The current state of humanity is what makes it wrong. I look at the human race and I see only vileness and depravity, all because of an act known as sexuality. (laughs) He even puts the dot, dot, dots in there. I love that. Sex is by far the most evil concept in existence. The fact that life itself exists through sex just proves that life is flawed. The act of sex gives human beings a tremendous amount of pleasure. Pleasure they don't deserve. No one deserves to experience so much pleasure, especially since some humans get to experience it while some are denied it. When a man has sex with a beautiful woman, he probably feels like he is in heaven. The world is not supposed to be heaven. For some humans to actually be able to feel such heights of heavenly pleasure is selfish and hedonistic. The ultimate evil behind sexuality is the human female. (laughs) 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 They are the main instigators of sex. They control which men get it and which men don't. Women are flawed creatures and my mistreatment at their hands has made me realize this sad truth. There is something very twisted and wrong with the way their brains are wired. They think like beasts, and in truth, they are beasts. Women are incapable of having morals or thinking rationally. Yeah. (laughs) They are completely controlled by their depraved emotions and vile sexual impulses. Preach it. 
Oh, please. Because of this, the men who do get to experience the pleasures of sex and the privilege of breeding <laughs> are the men who women are sexually attracted to. That's right. The stupid, degenerate, obnoxious men. That's me. <laughs> yeah. I have observed this all my life. The most beautiful of women choose to mate with the most brutal of men instead uh -huh. of magnificent gentlemen like myself. <laughs> Yeah, gentlemen go on shooting rampages. Women should not have the right to choose who to mate and breed with. Ooh. I know. That decision should be made for them by rational men of intelligence. I assume that means you. If women continue to have rights, they will only hinder the advancement of the human race by breeding with degenerate men and creating stupid degenerate offspring. Not untrue. <laughs> <laughs> that's happening some places some people well we got it this we got this far <laughs> this will cause humanity to become even more depraved with each generation women have more power in human society than they deserve all because of sex there is no creature more evil and depraved than the human female <laughs> <laughs> Women are like a plague. They don't deserve to have any rights. Their wickedness must be contained in order to prevent future generations from falling degeneracy. Women are vicious, evil, barbaric animals, and they need to be treated as such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fully realizing these truths about the world, I have created the ultimate and perfect ideology of how a fair and pure world should work. It was that easy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm 22, and I have the world figured out. <laughs> in an ideal world, sexuality would not exist. It must be outlawed. In a world without sex, humanity will be pure and civilized. We're just really stressed out. Men will grow up healthily without having to worry about such a barbaric act. All men will grow up fair and equal because no man will be able to experience the pleasures of sex while others are denied it. The human race will evolve to an entirely new level of civilization, completely devoid of all the impurity and degeneracy that exists today. In order to completely abolish sex, women themselves would have to be abolished. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> this is great. All women must be quarantined like the plague they are, so that they can be used in a manner that actually benefits a civilized society. In order to carry this out, there must exist a new and powerful type of government under the control of one divine ruler, such as myself, of course. Of course. Of course. Of Who course. else? Supreme gentleman. The ruler that establishes this new order would have to, would have complete control over every aspect of society in order to direct it towards a good and pure place. At the disposal of this government, there needs to be a highly trained army of fanatically loyal troops, like Nazis, yeah. <laughs> in order to enforce such revolutionary laws. The first strike against women will be to <laughs> quarantine all of them in concentration camps. Ooh. At these camps, the vast majority of the female population will be deliberately starved to death. That would be an efficient and fitting way to kill them all off. I would take great pleasure and satisfaction in condemning every single woman on earth to starve to death. I would have an enormous tower built just for myself where I can oversee the entire concentration camp and gleefully watch them all die. If I can't have them, no one will. I'd imagine thinking to myself as I oversee this. Oh, whoops. Screwed that one up. Women represent everything that is unfair in this world. And in order to make the world a fair place, they must all be eradicated. <laughs> a few women would be spared, however, for the sake of reproduction. These women would be kept and bred in secret labs. There, they will be artificially inseminated with sperm samples in order to produce offspring. Their depraved nature will slowly be bred out of them in time. This is like Ayn Rand's... Uh, uh, <laughs> Fountainhead? No, the one with the light bulb on the cover. Oh, Ooh, I can't remember. Anthem. Anthem. It's like Anthem. That's what they do in Anthem. Really? Yeah. That's oh, how geez. it is. There's breeding facilities. Anyway. Future generations of men would be oblivious to these remaining women's existence, and that is for the best. If a man grows up without knowing of the existence of women, there will be no desire for sex. Sexuality will completely cease to exist. Love will cease to exist. There will no longer be any imprint of such concepts in the human psyche. Psyche. It is the only way to purify the world. In such a pure world, the man's mind can develop to greater heights than ever before. 
Future generations will live their lives free of having to worry about the barbarity of sex and women, which will enable them to expand their intelligence and advance the human race to a state of perfect civilization. Everyone's just sitting in their mom's room playing World of Warcraft. No, you know what would happen if there were no women in the world and it was just men? They would use all of that intelligence that they'd gain for creating awesome sex toys. Yeah. That's what would happen. Yeah. That's where it would go because mm. there's no women. Mm. <laughs> it is such a shameful pity that my ideal world cannot be created. I realized long ago that there is no way I could possibly rise to such a level of power in my lifetime with the way the world is now. Such a thing will never become a reality for me, but it did give me something to fantasize about as I burned with hatred towards all women for rejecting me throughout the years. This whole viewpoint and ideology of abolishing sex stems from being deprived of it all my life. If I cannot have it, I will do everything I can to destroy it. My orchestration of the day of retribution is my attempt to do everything in my power to destroy everything I cannot have. Why is there a comma there? My God. Didn't this kid go to college? Mm. All of those beautiful girls I've desired so much in my life, but can never have because they despise and loathe me, I will destroy. All of those popular people who live hedonistic lives of pleasure, I will destroy, because they never accepted me as one of them. I will kill them all and make them suffer, just just as they have made me suffer. It is only fair. Why do things have to be this way? I'm sure that is the question everyone will be asking after the day of retribution is over. They will all be asking why, indeed, why. That is the question I've had for everyone throughout all my years of suffering. Why was I condemned to live a life of misery and worthlessness while other men were able to experience the pleasures of sex and love with women? Why do things have to be this way? I ask all of you. All I ever wanted was to love women and in turn to be loved by them back. Their behavior towards me has only earned my hatred, and rightfully so. I am the true victim in all of this. (laughs) I am the good guy. Humanity struck at me first by condemning me to experience so much suffering. I didn't ask for this. I didn't want this. I didn't start this war. I wasn't the one who struck first, but I will finish it by striking back. I will punish everyone, and it will be beautiful. Finally, at long last, I can show the world my true worth. That's the end. That's Uh, the end of the manifesto. And we all know what happened after that. We all know what happened after that. Oh, God, what a crazy little piece of garbage. I know, right? Here, I got some stuff from Wiki Wiki Quote. So here's a couple things just from his uh, bodybuilding.com, uh, pickupartisthate.com, and Forever Alone posts. Shoes won't help you get white girls. White girls are disgusted by you, silly little Asian. <laughs> <laughs> Full Asian men are disgustingly ugly and white girls will never go for you. And these are things that he wrote? These are things he wrote. Oh my lord. You're just butt hurt, butt hurt that you were born as an Asian piece of shit. So you lash out by linking these fake pictures. You even admit that you wish you were half white. You'll never be half white and you'll never fulfill your dream of marrying a white woman. I suggest jump off a bridge. <laughs> oh, I know. Oh my god. God, take your own advice. Ugh. Men shouldn't have to look like and act like big animalistic beasts to get women. The fact that women still prioritize brute strength just shows their minds haven't fully evolved. Oh, man. Women are not drawn to the indicators of evolutionary fitness. If they were, they'd be all over me. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I know. And it's always like like they ha- they're not evolved enough. Uh it's like this natural thing you know like yeah it's not a choice they're making it's just how they are yeah there's nothing that you could have done fucking idiot never insult the style of elliot roger i am the most stylish person in the world just Ugh. look at my profile pic just, just look at my profile pic <laughs> that's just one that of my proves it. that's just one of my fabulous outfits the sweater i'm wearing in this picture is 500 dollars from neiman marcus like a fucking little girl. Do you know what I could do with five hundred dollars? And he bought a fucking sweater. I know, I know. That and, spoiled piece of shit. You know, and he bought all kinds of nice guns. And why couldn't he just be happy with the guns? You know, he could have been happy with any number of things that he already had. I know. He had a great setup. 
He was totally taken care of, and he might have been the rest of his life if he hadn't fucked it all up. Mm -hmm. If we can't solve our problems, we must destroy our problems. One day, incels will realize their true strength in numbers and will overthrow this oppressive feminist system. Start envisioning a world where women fear you. An incel uh, is a... Uh, what do they call that? A contract, uh, contraction of involuntary celibate, and it, it's like a, a classification on uh, like pickup artist world, mm. and it's people who are like uh, involuntarily celibate; they can't get laid. Mm. So you, you know, in sales. Oh God. Let's see. There's some more good stuff. So <clears throat> you know, he got a lot of like lottery obsessions too. He was driving to Arizona all the time from uh, Santa Barbara. <laughs> To buy Powerball lotteries. And he was dropping hundreds of dollars, wasn't he? Uh, Yeah, he'd spend about $700 towards the end of that. Oh, God. There's one really good quote I really need to... And it's about one of his friends. Well, here, but before I get to that, here's some, uh, here's some more incel talk. I spent the rest of that night pondering over what was in store for me at that point in my life. I was no longer a teenager, and I'll never be able to experience having life... Uh, having sex as a teenager. Having life. <laughs> On the second day, they started inviting their... Yeah, this is from their uh, encounter with Chance. It was that pathetic feeling of not having a hot girlfriend on my arm while some other boys in the theater did. What I truly wanted, what I truly needed, all caps, was a girlfriend. I needed a girl's love. I needed to feel worthy as a male. And for, for so long as I have felt worthless, and it's all girls' fault... No girl wanted to be my girlfriend. A man having a beautiful girl by his side shows the world that he is worth something. Because obviously, that girl sees him as something, you know, worth. <laughs> I fucked that up. Sees some sort of worth in him. Ugh, lordy lord. Okay, so. So you can see why he wanted a woman. Why he couldn't just move past it. Why mm -hmm. he couldn't have just, like, dedicated his life to Jesus well, and became yeah. a priest. I mean, the way he looked at it, it was impossible for him. It was a gold chain. Mm -hmm. It was the it was the Armani shirt. It was the blonde girl. He, it was, what was important, it was that people saw him as better. And I'm 100% I'm sure his parents, his rich parents, class-obsessed parents probably instilled this into him. Because, you know, they act all, if you ever watched, like, the interview that his dad did of Barbara Walters, you know, he's all coy, like, oh, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't realize my son was a mass murderer. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, 99% of introverted people, you know, that make edgy comments, they don't do that. You but know? this kid had a problem. The, he it was a, very he, evident. You know. There was something wrong with him, the way he was interacting with complete strangers, of all people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. People he hadn't seen in years, too. Yeah. So, here's a good thing. <clears throat> here's quotes about Elliot Rodgers. Yeah. So, when I first met Elliot, he was aged eight or nine, and I could see then that there was something wrong with him. I'm not a psychologist, but looking back now, he strikes me as someone who was broken from the moment of conception. It appeared to me that he had an overwhelming lack of confidence, but not in a particularly endearing way. Sad, but not endearing. You were hoping that inside there was a normal kid wanting to come out and that he would overcome his shyness and bloom in some way. What became evident only after reading the manifesto and watching that video was that he was actually hiding. Was that what he was actually hiding? Oh. Was this horribly twisted little monster. Thank you, babe. Del Lauder, how I tried to help Elliot Roger. Uh, here's a thing from his dad. When you go to sleep normally, you have a nightmare, and you wake up, and, oh, everything's okay. No, I go to sleep, and I might have a nice dream. And then I wake up, and, I, and slowly the truth of what happened dawns on me. And that is that my son was a mass murderer. Peter Roger. Bob Weiss. There's someone... Ah, yes, here it is. Uh, everyone is focusing on Elliot's lack of success with women, but they need to appreciate he was unable to communicate with anyone. He was so shy and painfully awkward. He had a boring personality, and he didn't talk. He would never dream of approaching a girl. He, was, he just expected them to come to him, and they didn't. Even if any of them ever had, 
it wouldn't have lasted long because he wouldn't chat to them. He was incredibly hard to talk to, and I would always make sure Addison was there with me when we met up. Uh, Philip Blossier. That's uh, Philip and Addison were twins I used to hang out with. Mm. He cr- he, uh, he'd cry in front of them, like at the Getty and stuff. And yeah. <clears throat> Here's another thing by Dr. Adam Langford. Elliot Roger was trying to act out the role of a film star when he went on his killing spree to make up for the fact he felt like a failure in real life. He clearly did not feel he had the status he deserved. In his last YouTube video, which he explicitly filmed to leave a legacy, he cast himself as a movie star. Uh, That's actually interesting. His dad made films, but he's the one... You know, but like all of his little, like he kind of wrote a script, that manifesto, mm-hmm. and the, and he made about an hour long worth of like videos of a documentary. Well, um, didn't he talk proudly yeah. at one point of, his you know, father. his dad's film connections mm-hmm. and, you know. Yeah, although he was angry at his dad for making that Oh God movie that failed. Oh God. Yeah, that's what the movie was called. It was about this movie where Peter Roger goes all around the world asking people what is God right after like the 9-11 thing happened. Mm-hmm. It failed. He lost a lot of money doing yeah, it. Yeah, of course it failed. In another of his clips, he appears to reference the film American Psycho. And there's a lot of American Psycho. Uh, I don't know what you call it. Like, there's things that kind of line up with it. And that, and they, I'm not, Synchronicities? Yeah. And it's not like, I don't know, he never referenced it like directly. Because I know like he might have been somewhat self-aware because he never mentions his penis size, if you ever notice, but he feels so inferior to every man. Mm-hmm. You yeah. Know? But he you're tactfully right. never mentions that. Yeah, he's he feels so superior to everyone else, but that's one thing that he just doesn't talk mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. And it might be that he has taken the main character, Patrick Bateman, as a role model. Bateman, played by Christian Bale, is a successful law- Wall Street banker who picks up women and then butchers them after sex. The, ir- the irony is that Bale's character is both sexually successful and a killer, but for Roger, his sexual frustration was the driving force behind the anger. However, before, however, both share deep feelings of sexual desire for women and aggression towards them. Uh, here's some stuff from victims and victims' family. The autobiography of the young man posted online that day is notable for its shallowness and its entitlement. Yeah, that's... Hmm. Yeah, basically. Accurate. Yeah. Those are harsh words, but there's no other way to describe his, other, his utter lack of empathy, imagination, and engagement with the life of others. He often descri- He's often described as mentally ill, but he seemed seems instead to be someone who was exceptionally susceptible to the madness of this society around him. His misogyny was our culture's misogyny. His sad dream of becoming wealthy, admired, and sexually successful was a banal, widely marketed dream. His preoccupation with brand name products and status status symbols was exactly what the advertising industry tries to inject into our minds. His fantasy of attaining power and status... At the point of a gun is the fantasy sold to us by the gun lobby and the action movies in which some invulnerable Superman unerringly shoots down the bad guys. God made a god by his gun. So you could also call him a victim of the media. Um, definitely. He just soaked all that bullshit. And he, he like didn't know how to filter it. He had no filter. No. And he, I mean, this also happens... When people are, he has the classic symptoms of someone that is extremely isolated, like mm-hmm. being very hypersensitive, mm-hmm. um, you know, these grandiose, angry, hateful things. Those are people who are isolated. Like when I was isolated, I had very similar, my attitude had a very similar flavor, but of course I was still kind of a rational human being. Mm-hmm. You know, I got better, I found think, you. I think a lot of people have been in situations like that for shorter or longer periods of time at one point or another Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right well you know i wanted to do that exorcism story but we're already like an hour and 15 minutes in here so i think i'm gonna do that next week uh maybe jeff and courtney will come down and i'll uh share that story with them and you know but it's it's been a pretty long podcast already it's already an hour in 
I'm probably going to be editing this tonight and tomorrow. So, uh, you know, have a good night, folks. It was fun reading Elliot Roger. I hope you enjoyed it as much as me. If you have any comments or just like any um, any analysis you have or any ideas you want to share about this, I'm extremely interested. You know, I, I was di digesting this manifesto for about a week. Uh, it made me feel very weird. You know, I had a big change in my life recently. It's kind of personal. I don't really want to bring it up, but, you know, it it is connected to this in a very similar way yeah so um you know good night everybody oh good night <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i forgot she was on the radio <laughs> <laughs> do, do, do. <laughs> <laughs> uh always leaving with a laugh here all right all right how do i stop this oh god